may find it's a rather difficult lecture. Maybe it's uh, uh, a little different than what you're normally uh, used to as far as New Testament studies. But th this is a foundational lecture and that you need to be acquainted with what's known as historical and literary criticism. It especially uh, involves uh, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, and then Mark's encountered in that as well. Uh, I want to teach you a little bit about the history of what's known as the synoptic problem, and uh, the history, its failures, and a possible answer to it. I especially... I uh, want to use uh, W.R. Farmer's uh, book, The Synoptic Problem, A Critical Analysis. The, uh, uh, he, he helps, us, helps me introduce this lecture to you as to uh, what was going on in the world that began what we're going to be studying. He said it was in the 18th century that the major problem that Students of, of the New Testament faced was chronology. For the 18th century New Testament scholar, chronology was regarded as essential for true history. And so, when you had conflicting chronologies of the four Gospels, men who were beginning to uh, be rather critical and skeptical because of the age they were living in, began to question the reality or the uh, reliability of our Gospels. They, uh, they wondered if they were really trustworthy witnesses to the life and ministry of Christ. So there were some attempts to solve the difficulties, but these were hampered because of confusion uh, that were seen to be irreconcilable traditions of the church. And, and I want to give you these three, and then we're going to begin with a lecture. But the, the three problems were is that Clement of Alexandria stated the Gospels with genealogies, such as Matthew and Luke, were written before the Gospels without genealogies, Mark and John. So Clement of Alexandria said those with genealogies came first. Now the second thing is that Augustine said that no evangelist wrote his gospel in ignorance of the work of his predecessors and that the order was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he says this is in clear conflict with the testimony of Clement of Alexandria. He said Augustine also regarded Mark as an epitomizer of Matthew. So remember Clement of Alexandria said Matthew and Luke were first and then Mark and John. Augustine says Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Third, Papias states that Mark was the interpreter of Peter and regards his gospel as based on the witness of Peter. Now that's in conflict with Augustine's view that Mark is the epitomizer of Matthew, for it's difficult to see why Mark would have been so dependent upon Matthew if he was in close contact with Peter and had access to Peter's knowledge of the gospel tradition. So, having those three problems that uh, one, uh, Clement of Alexandria says again, let me say it again for you, Clement of Alexandria says that you have the Gospels with the uh, genealogies in them first, Matthew and Luke. And yet Augustine says, no, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the third problem comes with Papias, who said Mark was the interpreter of Peter, and yet it seems that Mark either uses Matthew, Matthew and Luke, and yet Augustine says, no, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then the third problem comes with Papias, who said Mark was the interpreter of Peter, and yet it seems that Mark either uses Matthew or Matthew uses Mark. Uh, in that situation and confusion, two important developments take place in the second half of the 18th century. Investigators attempt to overcome the confusion of church tradition by going behind the evidence from the church fathers and developing some new hypothesis on the basis of evidence provided by New Testament writings 
especially the Acts of Apostles, and reinterpretation of statements made by the fathers regarding the existence of early Gospels no longer existent. Secondly, the older type of Gospel harmonies designed to reconcile the accounts of all four Gospels are replaced by a new type of parallel where, where no attempts even made to use John, except in isolated places where there's evidence of a close connection between John, one or more of the other three Gospels. The, uh, this reflected a consciousness that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are closely related to one another and uh, than they were to John. The most famous and influential of these new gospel parallels was done by Griesbach, who was published in 1774 and 75. So what happened is there was a breaking of tradition. So they first broke with the tradition that the canonical gospels were written before all others. And second, it broke with the tradition of attempting to harmonize John without a Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, once those are tra- two traditions are broken, possibilities are virtually unlimited, and hundreds of new hypotheses are going to be advanced. So a history of the synoptic problem is a history of the basic ideas that have influenced men's thinking about this problem. And so this is what we want to look at. The rise of source criticism. We're going to be looking at several kinds of source criticism, but the rise of this is that in the same year that the U.S. declared its independence, J.J. Griesbach wrote his book, A Synopsis of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So in 1776, he writes this book, J.J. Griesbach. And the approach to gospel study is born, as I've just indicated to you. He places the text of Matthew, Mark, and Luke in parallel columns for easy study. Again, the gospel of John is only incidentally included. So we have this new term, synoptic gospel. It's a new approach to studying the first three gospels. Now again, he's not attempting to create a new approach. He simply accepted Augustine's view that Mark abbreviated Matthew, adding the modification that Mark also made use of Luke. So, he would have said, as you see the uh, the picture here, uh, Mark would have been dependent upon Luke and Matthew. Matthew would have been the first. Luke would have used Matthew. Mark would have used, uh, uh, used that as well. So, the primary theory is that Mark was the first of the Gospels written. This is this new theology or or a new uh, uh, understanding in the 18th century. Mark was first, and that both Matthew and Luke used Mark as their primary source. This is called the Markan hypothesis or the priority of Mark. So as we think about source criticism, we're we're wanting to, to know what sources were available for the Gospels to be written from. And this first theory says that uh, Mark was written first, Matthew used Mark, and Luke used Matthew and Mark. H.J. Holtzman in 1863 added another source, this dubbed Q. As you see in the little box here, you have Mark and Q. Mark would have been there. Q comes from the German word Quellen, which means source. And it comprises some 230 or so verses that Matthew and Luke have in common. So the Markan hypothesis now becomes known as the two-source hypothesis. And those two sources are Mark and Q. So just like you see at the top there, you'd have Mark and Q would be the two sources that Matthew would have used for his gospel and that Luke would have used. You uh, could even... uh, Eventually, you're going to to move it to a three-source hypothesis. There are various theories uh, that are developed concerning outlandish things. 
Many New Testament scholars assume Mark's the first gospel written. All the problems that involved how the first three are related to one another are collectively called the synoptic problem by scholars. Synoptic means to look at, you know, optic, uh, look, and then see them together. So you're looking at them together. How do we explain Matthew, Mark, and Luke having so much that's the same and yet so much that's different? Well, in 1924... Each Streeter in his four Gospels studied the origin proposed a four-document hypothesis or four sources. Remember, we started out with uh, just uh, just Mark being used by Matthew, and then we with so Mark and priority. Then you have uh, Mark and Q, and now then you have Mark Q proto Matthew, which is M or material unique to Matthew, and proto-Luke, or L, material unique to Luke. So the four sources then produce our three canonical Gospels. So this is B.H. Streeter's four-document or four-source hypothesis. Matthew, proto-Matthew, Mark, Q, and proto-Luke. So proto-Matthew would be made up of Matthew, Mark, and Q. Luke would be made up of Mark, Q, and Proto-Luke. I hope I said that right. Luke would be made up of Mark, Q, and Proto-Luke. So, that, that, that whole discussion involves source criticism. What sources were used, literary sources were used, to create our Gospels? Mark, and then was used by Matthew and Luke, and then it's Mark and Q, and then it was the fourth source hypothesis by B. H. Streeter, uh, Proto Matthew, Mark Q, and Proto Luke. Well, scholars found and discovered that that really didn't solve their problem. They still had problems with trying to figure out why each of these were so different and unique. So they they moved to another discussion that's called form criticism. And this form criticism represented a new approach to gospel studies that appeared before Streeter's book appeared. In German, it's called form Geschichte. Form Geschichte, or form history. The interest was more than just the final written stage of gospel tradition. Source criticism deals with literary literary uh, productions, things that are written on papyrus and parchment. The form criticism wants to move behind the written literary stage to an oral stage. They felt you began with the written and you go backwards to breaking materials into these isolated, independent units called pericopi or pericopes. So form criticism deals with oral tradition. Source criticism with literary tradition. So they want to go behind the literary and find out what was the oral tradition. The uh, pericope sought to identify the unit by its form and tried to locate the original life setting, or what's it called in German, that sits in Leben. And you ought to learn that term, sits im Leben, the situation in life. They, they wanted to know why stories such as the woman caught in adultery or certain miracle stories, why were they remembered? What caused them to, to be remembered in the minds of people? Well, for the form critic, the vast majority of Sitzim Lieben situations in life was the early church and not the life of Christ. You see, the form critic felt the Gospels were not like classic literary works, but they're like folk tales. The, the Gospel writers are just recording the short, pithy stories or sayings that circulated orally among the early Christians. So for the form critic, what we have in the Gospels are not necessarily uh, exactly what Jesus said, but it's from the memory of the early church. And they're simply recording these little stories and and so one way to kind of think about it would be that uh, folks that live in Pineville liked uh, and needed for their own spiritual uh, growth and things miracles.
And then if you go to Middlesboro, there would be those who uh, would uh, have kept things such as the parables. And then if you go to uh, in Knoxville, you would find there are those who kept healing stories. And if you move, move up to uh, uh, Lexington, Kentucky, they would have maybe kept stories that had to do with uh, uh, parables of Jesus. And then what the uh, gospel writers did was they went to those places and they gathered up these individual stories or pericopi and then weaved them together into a gospel. So it has to do with orally circulating stories in the early church. So for form critics, they don't see the writers of the gospels as real writers. But they're compilers of the traditions that have been adapted to their own communities. So, for them, the uh, gospel writers aren't really writing the gospel. They're just picking up stories that the early church either invented or heard about Jesus and uh, twisted them for their own purpose. Some supporters of this would be Martin Debelius with his Form Geschichte des Evangeliums, 1919. History of the Gospels. He found a source of information to come from the early church's sermons, paradigms, tales, legends, and exhortations. Rudolf Bultemann, the history of the synoptic tradition, 1921, was so disturbed by this that he sought to demythologize the gospel materials of those items that the early church had added to the historical Jesus. He gets involved in what's known as the quest for the historical Jesus. And you'll want to remember the name of Bultmann as you do New Testament studies. Uh, while you may not agree with his position on the Gospels, uh, he, he is a major name in New Testament studies. Well, just as source criticism found it couldn't answer all the problems and all of the uh, questions about uh, how do you explain why Matthew was like Mark and like Luke, and yet uh, is so different. The source criticism couldn't answer it either. It, it, it eventually proved to be empty and hollow. So you have the development of redaction criticism. So you go from a, a literary criticism to an oral criticism behind the literary to now back to a literary attempt. It's called redaction criticism. Since both uh, Jesus and the Gospels almost disappeared under form criticism, how can you give an account for the fact that Gospels are unity and have a sense of purpose? It, it seems that somebody had to produce them. It was more than just uh, local stories. Abstractions such as communities don't write books. So the focus shifted to redactors. That is, a redactor is a compiler, an editor, or a writer. The focus on redactors came to be known as redaction geschichte, or redaction criticism. The beginnings of redaction criticism began with the students of Bultmann, which I told you earlier was so important as a form critic. But the students move into this redaction criticism. Gunther Borkham sets the pace with his work on Matthew, followed by uh, Hans Konzelman's Theology of Luke in 54, and then Willie Markson's Mark the Evangelist came out in 1956. What do they accomplish? Well, they add, they add another sits and leave another situation in life. You, you see the, the uh, form critic found that oral tradition. They looked at that world, that situation of life. The second one is the oral period of the early church. Uh, well, the first was the life of Jesus. The second is the oral period. And then the third is the evangelist in his circumstances. So we ask ourselves, how is redaction criticism different? Tradition versus authors. Form critics say the evangelists are compilers of tradition. Redaction criticism saw them as authors in their own right. The four critics said that that uh, the gospel writers simply went and like they were uh, finding uh, uh, pearls to put on a necklace. That that's all they were doing was was stringing those things along. 
But Redaction Critic says no, even though they're an editor, they, they really are an author. Another comparison between form criticism and redaction criticism is involves smaller units versus larger units. Form criticism was concerned with smaller units of tradition and how they came into existence. Form criticism took each little pericope, each little independent story, and tried to come up with the, that, how that got into the gospel. But redaction criticism is concerned with large units, even up to the gospels themselves. A third difference would be theological intent. What is it that the author was seeking to do? Reform criticism, because it only focused on those smaller units, never did any justice with the intent of the gospel. They, they didn't even didn't even involve the question, didn't even consider the issue. Whereas redaction criticism concerned with the theological intent of the author. Redaction just wanted to know why did the author take all of those stories and put them together in the order and the pattern that he did. They believed that there was the author had a theological purpose or an intent. They were trying to say something about who Jesus was and what the early church considered Jesus to be. As I mentioned earlier, you have the question about, is there just one sense of Leban, one situation in life, or is there three? Form criticism is concerned with only one. That's the early church. What did they understand? What was the purpose of all of the pericopi? But redaction criticism is concerned with all three sets of Libans. They want to know about the life of Christ. They want to know about the uh, oral background in the early church. But even redaction criticism has problems. It didn't go far enough to establish itself as the overarching method to solve all the basic problems of gospel research. Redaction criticism's problem was a lack of clear methodology. They, they had no consistent way of doing things, and there was a narrow focus. So redaction criticism failed to be everything that it could be. So as a current Clear Creek student, you see the current situation. What is a Clear Creeker to do? How is he to understand this? Well, there's no dominant theory in vogue at the present moment. There are some current trends that you need to be aware of. Uh, we talked about source criticism. It's a literary problem. What sources did Matthew and Luke and, and Mark use? And then we had form criticism, seeking to get behind that literary and to the oral that failed, and so we came back to literary, saw the uh, uh, writers of Matthew, Mark, and Luke as editors or redactors, and it falls short. So what's going to be going on now? Well, there's some scholars that follow the keep them around group. Some scholars that acknowledge the above methodologies have limitations, but believe they may eventually help reach an answer to the background of the gospel production. So we're just going to go around in circles, around in circles, just keep them around. Then you have the structuralist. It's a part of a larger strategy called literary criticism. And the essence of structuralism is that there underlies all expression and narrative of structure in our minds, a deep structure which determines co courses that our thoughts and expressions take. So to understand the deep structure, any piece of literature can be understood. Yet when it reaches a gospel studies, it's so complicated that structuralism is not very productive. Well, then we have narrative criticism. It's another literary approach. been around about a century. It was eclipsed for a while by the more radical criticisms, but now receiving attention again. It sees the biblical text as a literary product with a multitude of complexities. You can focus on literary plot, structure, order of events, and dramatic tensions. 
The intended impact on the reader and other such matters are emphasized. Less emphasis on grammar, theological ideas, and historical backgrounds. Just a few others that we might mention. Reader response theories. Not so much a focus on what happened in the first century, but what's it doing to me now as I read it. Another is deconstructionism. View such that all the text loses all objective meaning, becomes whatever the reader takes it to mean. And I think a lot of our people in our churches operate right out of this view. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to you? We might want to be careful of that. And three, social scientific theories. These are weak because of the subjectively placing sociological terms on the material of the Bible. So what's the current position of the synoptic problem? Well, the dominant position in liberal New Testament theology is Mark is the first. Both Matthew and Luke use Mark and Q. There are some modern opponents to Mark and Priority. Dom Chaplin, B.C. Butler, W.R. Farmer, who I began quoting with uh, this lecture. Others that hold to the position include E. Lineman, as their synoptic problem, rethinking literary dependence. As a concluding remark, all these theories reveal that some scholar would prefer to leave God out of production in the New Testament totally. Perhaps there's a desire on their part to simply treat the Bible as another work of literature. Now, the Bible can withstand that test because it is the Word of God. If you have some questions on this, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to call or email at, uh, at rlucas at ccbbc.edu. I'd love to, uh, to uh, further discuss this issue with you if you have an interest in it.